From 1914 to 1918, the ultimate consumer received his goods regularly. No delay in deliveries. FOB Verdun, COD Soissons, the Argonne, the Somme. The munitions makers guaranteed satisfaction. Someone killed with every shot or your money refunded. Maybe. $25,000, the cost of killing a man. War scares are the stuff that wars are made from. When the public is war conscious, the munitions moguls prosper. Feverish preparations for war are made on all sides, and that is the lifeblood of the arms business. This year, the world will spend $5 billion for the instruments of war. With the complete motorization and mechanization of the world's armies, this industry has experienced its most prosperous period since the war. Massive new tanks are being built to tear across the countryside. Infantry will be mobile and will travel in these armor-plated forces. New amphibian monsters are being turned out which move over land and underwater equally well. Tanks will lay far-flung smoke screens, fire gas bombs, conceal machine guns, and transport troops. Swift, deadly battleships are ready and in construction. Eternal vigilance may be the price of peace, but the battleship in a peace. Destroyers can be picked up for about four million. Armor plate costs the United States government about $500 a ton. 33 and a third percent more than Britain pays for her tonnage. Mighty planes rise from great naval airplane carriers, which cost 20 million apiece. The United States leads the world in this type of naval aircraft. In the war, France and her neighbors have taken the lead. Italy's armada of the air is double that of the United States and still growing. Chemists are feverishly experimenting a fiendish competition, each trying to produce a gas more deadly and horrible than any heretofore known. Chemical factories are springing up everywhere, preparing the poisons which will wipe out the civilian front in the next war. It's the masses of the population, not only the soldiers, who will suffer from the next war's chemical output. The populace will live in unremitting terror of terrible lung diseases from germ bombs, of suffocation from chlorine. Gas masks will offer scant protection against these lethal fumes. Tear gases, mustard and lewisite blistering gases, nerve poisoners. There will be blood poisoners too, and incendiary gases. Gases that degenerate the glands and the brain tissues. Gases that blind and kill and choke. All this endless search for more hideous poisons goes on in spite of a ban on gas warfare which the nations of the world ratified in 1908 and reaffirmed in 1925. The foreign offices and war departments of these countries have evidently failed to get together, for the diplomats forbid the use and manufacture of poison gas, and the warlords continue with its ghastly development. Cities will be starved out as these deadly bombs descend to poison food in huge warehouses, to contaminate drinking water, to destroy everything they touch. Every month, the dealers in death proclaim a deadlier gas. It keeps you war conscious. In the devil's laboratory, the bacteriologists are preparing all manner of playful little germs to inflict horrible diseases on whole cities. Germ bombs in harmless disguises are the newest thing. One of these germ fountain pens could bring the plague to the city of New York. Three commercial airplanes could infect the metropolis from Coney Island to the Bronx in three hours. War hysteria is a legitimate business builder for the munitions mogul, a trade stimulant. Patriotic societies everywhere, in all sincerity, organize preparedness parades and demonstrations. Over the radio into millions of homes go fervent speeches designed to arouse the militant spirit of the people. Loudspeakers carry these messages to eager listening crowds. Colorful posters stir the emotions and stampede the nation's youth into a patriotic regimentation under the colors. Passions are inflamed, indignation aroused, patriotism exploited, and the highest of human ideals desecrated by these manipulators of mass hysteria who turn the idealism of a people into inflammatory demands for war. land and classrooms, the young ideas being taught how to shoot. In Italy, they start them at eight. Just good, clean fun, practicing to be the unknown soldier. Speakers in colleges harangue impressionable youth on the glory of past wars and the preparedness being made for the next. 
speakers, speakers everywhere, turning emotion into hysteria, green shirts, blue shirts, red shirts, all heralding the swift approach of the war that is to come. Over the wires flash stories of the need of preparation for war. Linotype operators tap out the message of preparedness. Newspaper presses roar as they carry the story to patriotic, believing citizens. All that is needed now is the excuse, and here's as good one as they'll ever find. It worked before, and it'll work again. Now, if you can't afford a first-class billion-dollar war, and you want something in snappy second-hand slaughter, there are several spots in the heart of New York which will equip you for plain and fancy killing at bargain prices. Bannerman and Sons is one of these outfitters deluxe to those military powers whose dreams of conquest exceed their financial standing. They'll sell you anything from a Civil War pistol to a battleship. Their store is considered one of the world's finest military museums. They also publish an illustrated catalog of 350 pages, which is a masterpiece of pious justification of their trade. Poems and quotations from the Bible are printed alongside of prices for shrapnel and cannon. Here on an isolated island in the Hudson River is the Bannerman Arsenal and Storehouse, a veritable medieval castle loaded with arms, packed, and ready for shipment. Bannerman is an ancient and honorable firm founded after the Civil War when it bought at auction large quantities of used military goods. Since then, they have bought about 90% of the United States Army's outmoded merchandise at auction and resold it for cash. A small but ambitious nation wants a battleship in a hurry. They can't afford to pay three or four million for a used cruiser, so they buy an old freighter from a junk shop. One of these second-hand dealers in arms gets to work on a complete transformation. When the boat is delivered, it may not resemble the most up-to-date of battleships, but it has a bulletproof vest and can do plenty of damage to the opponent's poor navy, which is of the same origin. Bannerman and others like him are the outfitters for many a small-time war. Small-time, in this instance, means any war in which thousands are killed rather than millions. The rifts in Morocco under Abdel El Krim patronized the French and Spanish junk shops. But the big powers soon discovered that a machine gun in the hand of an Arab is a very unhealthy weapon. An African potentate buys up the leftover guns of a European power and starts scaring his neighbors. It's amazing how quickly a backward people can learn to manipulate these firearms. 